shall rise up for prayer. You want to commit yourself to the Lord today in prayer that the Lord Himself will teach us by His Spirit that what He teaches us today will be indelible in our hearts, will profit us, and through us will profit many other people who will hear the word through our leaders, as well as through us. Commit yourself to the Lord, that yours will be the privilege of the Spirit of God getting so near, making your life valuable enough that He Himself will speak to your heart. And pray that every hindrance to the receptivity or reception of the word, the Lord will take away from your heart and your life. You'll be that disciple, that learner, that follower of Jesus, that has the love, the desire, that the word of God will bear fruit in your life. Thirty fold, sixty fold, a hundred fold. That the word will lead those who are just coming, will lead them to real, real salvation. There will be definite regeneration through the word, leading them to discover who they are in Christ or without Christ. And then making them to pray, seeking the face of the Lord, that all their sins will be washed away, wiped away, and the Spirit of God will be a witness of their heart of the real, definite experience of instantaneous salvation. Let's pray that this word will also sanctify us. The Lord Jesus Christ prayed, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That the fire and the hammer in the word will break hard rocks of hearts in pieces. And will set on fire every chaff in the heart. And the Lord will burn with the word, fire of the word in the heart of the people. Revival fire will come, purifying fire, refining fire that will burn every chaff, everything that is not according to the will of God, everything carnal, worldly, fleshly, Adamic, the Lord will burn everything away. And through this word, the ever-increasing faith that brings the abundance of the power of the Holy Ghost in the baptismal indwelling, infilling measure will come upon us that through the entrance of the word will be able to testify, I'm saved, I'm sanctified, I'm filled, indwelt, baptized in the Holy Ghost. And this word will set our feet on the narrow path that leads to glory. And will live in the power of the word day by day, overcoming temptation, enduring trial and persecution, living victoriously to the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our gathering together tonight. Thank you, Lord, because you make us to be the fulfillment of that word. Unto him, unto Christ, shall the gathering of the people be. And Lord, we pray as we gather around the table of the Lord tonight, wanting to eat the bread of life and drink the water of life, we pray you'll feed us and satisfy every soul in Jesus' name. And the power that comes from the word 
a regenerating power, a purifying power power is sanctifying power oh lord we pray you grant to us in jesus name and the empowerment the enablement of the spirit will also be evident in us as we take in your word and then this word will work powerfully effectually in our hearts in jesus name open our eyes to see the things you want us to see that we, Lord, in the strength and power of your spirit, will stand firm, steadfast, unmovable, unshakable, standing on the rock that is higher than ours. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. You can sit down. Tonight we come to Daniel chapter 5. And it's wonderful as we look at the beginning of this chapter. And everything we read here, everything we notice here will bring an important lesson to us. We just finished studying chapter 4. And in chapter 4 we met Nebuchadnezzar. And now we're coming to chapter 5 and we're meeting this man, Belshazzar. What a tragedy. What a terrible thing. That as we have studied Nebuchadnezzar, and eventually he learned about God. He knew that God is the living God, number one. Number two, he learned that God is the most high God. Number three, he learned that all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing before him. Number four, he learned that this God, he does his will both in heaven and also on earth. Number five, we learned that this Nebuchadnezzar said, nobody can stay him or stop his hand. Number six, he also said that there is God, whosoever walks in pride, that he is able to abase. And now we come to his son. And his son appeared to learn nothing. And Nebuchadnezzar had actually reached into all languages. And he had reached to all tongues, had reached to all people that dwell in all the earth. And he said to all the people in all the earth that they should understand that this God is mighty, is the most high. But how we say it? Somebody is an international evangelist, is an international preacher, international teacher, and sending the message of who God is to all the languages and all the nations. And then there's somebody very near in his house and didn't understand that. What a lesson we're learning and what danger it is for us who are globe trotting. That is, we move from nation to nation. And we move from city to city. And we move from state to state. And we're preaching the word of God. And we're spreading this truth of the scripture. In all nations and languages and every place. And maybe our own child living with us. Does not understand the very basic foundation of that word we're teaching others. And it's not just Nebuchadnezzar alone. You think about Samuel. Samuel was a great man, a good man, a godly man. And yet we're told the two sons he had, they did not know the Lord. And then you think about David and then he had Solomon. And Solomon, although he was reputed as the wisest man on earth, he did not live and walk in the footsteps of his father. But then, thank God, the whole picture is not all negative. We have Zechariah and Elizabeth, and we have John the Baptist, their son. The only one son that they had. And we're told that Zechariah was filled with the Spirit of God. Elizabeth filled with the Spirit of God, and thank God, John the Baptist filled also the Spirit of God. We're told that Zechariah was walking in righteousness, Elizabeth walking in righteousness, and then we're told that even John the Baptist, he lived such a righteous life. Herod feared him because he was a just man. And they were told he did many things when he heard him. And he turned the hearts of many people unto righteousness. I pray your family will be like that in Jesus' name. But now let's come to Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 1. Belshazzar, the king made a great feast 
to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem that the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels with that were taken out of the temple of the house of God which was at Jerusalem. And the king and the princes and his wives and his concubines drank in them. And they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver and of brass and of iron and of wood and of stone. In the same hour came forth the fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the place of the wall of the king's palace and the king saw part, the part of the hand that wrote then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of the loins were loosed and his knees moved one against another the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then came in all the king's wise men. But they could not reach the writing, nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was the king Belshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were astonished, astonished. Here we're looking at the final day of Belshazzar on earth. We're looking at the end of his reign. We're looking at the judgment that came upon him. But first, what did he do? How did he act? How did he project himself? And what idea did he give to people all around? I've read it to you already. He had this feast. We don't know what kind of feast. Was it birthday party? Who knows? Was it a kind of remembrance of his coronation? Who knows? Was it an anniversary of something that you know, he just remembered? And he said, I'm going to celebrate this. It doesn't really matter why he was having the feast. The point is, he had a sensual feast. A fleshly feast. A worldly feast. A feast that ended up with the judgment of God coming instantaneously upon him. And then a feast that made him to understand that God in heaven rules in the affairs of men. And God does not only watch what they do in a tabernacle or in a synagogue. He also watches what is done in the palace. God does not only watch what is done in Jerusalem. He also watches what is done in Babylon. He doesn't only watch what is done among the covenant people, the Jewish people. He also watches what is done among the Gentile people. Let nobody say... Because I'm not in Jerusalem, God is not going to look at anything I do. Because I'm not a member of the church, I'm not in Zion. Because of that, God is not going to see me. He watches everything. And he rules in the affairs of men. And whether it is Jerusalem or Babylon, or whether it is in Zion, or it is in, Assy in Syria, or whether it is in church, or in the place of work, he watches everything. And immediately, the hand appeared, and the hand began to write upon the wall. And when Belshazzar saw that, we are told his thoughts troubled him. 
His conscience troubled him. He knew that the judgment day had come. He was not going to escape. Before I go, I delve into Daniel chapter 5. I'm going to read to you Romans chapter 15 verse 4. Romans chapter 15 verse 4. You need to hold on to this so that you'll know the reason why we're studying this. Romans chapter 15 verse 4. For whatsoever things were reaching a full time, they were reaching for our learning. Whatever we reach today, whatever we read, study any time, they're reaching for our learning that we through patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have what? Hope. We're looking at First Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10 verse 11. Now, all these things happen unto them. For examples, you know that God says, I am God, I change not. What does that mean? It means that the way he looks at things, that way has not changed. His attitude to what people do, that attitude has not changed. That I am God, I change not. This is what Belshazzar did, and this was the reaction of the Almighty God. And if anybody does today what Belshazzar did at that time, God will act the same way, because it says all these things happen unto them. For example, and they are reaching for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Actually, what we're reading about today and what we're going to study a few weeks now in Daniel chapter 5. I'm back to Daniel chapter 5. In Daniel chapter 5, you'll find out that more than about 200 years before Daniel chapter 5, Isaiah had spoken about it. About 70 years before Daniel chapter 5, Jeremiah had spoken about it. If Belshazzar had just attended Bible study of Daniel, if Belshazzar had just taken the prophecy of the book of Isaiah, and he had read, and then if he kept that picture before him every time, and was looking ahead and saying, if I do this, this is what Isaiah said. Yes, I know. It's about 200 years ago he said that. But if I do this, this is what will happen if he kept that ahead of him. And if he had read Jeremiah and he had said, I'm keeping the book of Jeremiah in front of me every time. The temptation will come that I should go this direction. If I go that direction, I'm keeping the book of Jeremiah before me. If I do that, this is what will happen. What a lesson for believers today. Read the words of Jesus Christ. And know the edge. Of the life of the sinner. And keep that before you every time. And say, if I do this, this is going to be the end. It is by meditating. It's by focusing. It's by concentrating on what Christ had said. And he said, if this happens, if you walk on this broad road, if you copy Belshazzar, if you follow this direction, this is where it will end. If you will keep that before you every time, you think about that, you concentrate on that, you focus on that, you meditate on that, you'll never fall in Jesus' name. And look at Isaiah chapter 13, verse 19. And Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency shall be as when God overthrows Sodom and Gomorrah. Think about that. And then look at Isaiah chapter 47. I'm skipping some verses, but I'm going to start from verse 1. It says, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne. See that. See what Isaiah already said 200 years before. He said, Come down and sit on the ground because there is no throne. Thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance. I will not meet thee as a man. Sit thou silent and get thee into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called the lady of the kingdoms. Thou, go down some verses, it says, Thou hast trusted in thy wickedness. 
Thou hast said, Not seeth me, therefore shall evil come upon thee. Thou shalt not know from whence it riseth, and mischief shall fall upon thee. Thou shalt not be able to put it off, and desolation shall come upon thee suddenly, which, which thou shalt not know. Thou art weary. In the multitude of thy counsels, let now the astrologers, the star gazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things, and that shall come upon thee. None shall save thee. If Belshazzar had just read that, and he read it every day, and he said, I'll watch my way, I'll watch my path, I'll watch my steps, because this is the unchanging, unalterable, infallible word of God. And if it's going to happen to Babylon, it will not happen in my time. And for you to keep the word of God before you every time. And for you to say, here is what God has said. I will not allow the negative prophecy to come true on me. But you know, in the case of uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah also wrote about that. I'm going to pick these verses from chapter 50 of Jeremiah. Declare ye among the nations and publish and set up a standard publish and conceal not say Babylon is taken. Baal is confounded. Merodach is broken in pieces. Her idols are confounded. Her images are broken in pieces. For lo, I will raise and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country. And they shall set themselves in array against her. And the Chaldean shall be a spoil. All that spoil her shall be satisfied, says the Lord, I will lay, I have laid a snare for thee, and thou art also taken, O Babylon, and thou was not aware. Thou was not aware. While Belshazzar was having his feast and drinking with all those lords and with all those wives and concubines, he didn't know that the, that the uh, people of the Medes and the Persians, they were just entering in at that time. And that's what the Lord said through Jeremiah, thou art found and thou art caught because thou was striven against the Lord. It says, the king of Babylon hath heard the report of them, and his hands wax feeble. And Guish took hold of him, and the pangs of a woman in travail, as of a woman in, in travail. Babylon is suddenly falling and destroyed. Look at this, it's very important. Je Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 11. This is very clear, very plain. It says, The Lord has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes. For his device is against Babylon to destroy it. Why? Because it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple. You know, if you're reading the Bible, you'll be able to escape a lot of calamities and judgments and damnation and danger, and you are going to escape. Because when, when Belshazzar stayed that sensual feast, and he was in his drinking party, he was ignorant of these prophecies. The feast was ill-timed. But Babylon had been under siege and attack by the Medes and the Persians for some time. While the depraved, blasphemous king was insulting the Almighty God, who, would soon, who he would soon face in a few hours on the other side of the grave, the Medes and the Persians were behind the city was about to enter and overthrow his kingdom. His last day on earth, his last opportunity was gone, and he went into eternity unprepared. It will not happen to you. He had what is called canal security. Canal security. False security. He felt secured, and he felt nothing will happen, and a lot happened. He was ushered into eternity without being ready. We're going to divide the study tonight to three parts. Number one, the sensual feast and profanity of the godless. The sensual feast and profanity of the godless. Number two, the supernatural finger and 
the power of God. Supernatural finger of God and the power of God. Number three, the soothsayer's failure and the perplexity of the guilty. Let's come to number one. The sensual feast and profanity of the godless. We're looking at chapter 5, verse 1. All through to verse 4. And Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. How many, how many people were with him in drinking this wine? Tell me out loud. A thousand. Think about that. The place that will, that will contain those people. Just misleading those people. Wanting to do evil. Wanting to insult God. Wanting to dishonor God. And yet calling, calling all these thousands of people together. So that they can join him in his evil deed. And Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels. Which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple. Which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines might drink therein. To drink, that's bad enough. To drink wine, to become drunk, that's bad enough. And then to now take the vessels, holy vessels, sacred vessels, or from the house of the Lord that have been taken away from Jerusalem and then to drink wine out of that. And while drinking wine out of that, to be praising idols, dead idols. That was terrible. That's what you read now in verse 3. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver and of brass and of iron, of wood and of stones. You know something? Sinners are very careless negligent, inattentive, they are cheese when their destruction is at hand. Belshazzar knew that the Medes and the Persians were engaged in warfare against Babylon, but he belittled and disdained them. The great city was well secured. The walls were impregnable. And the mighty gates were shut in his pride and self-conceit, in his carnal false security. He disdained the enemy, and he profaned the name and the worship of God. When carnal security and contempt for the God of heaven, when they unite together, they take over a man's life, and then destruction, irreversible judgment will be very near. How thoughtless Nebuchadnezzar was to pitch his magnificence against God's majesty. This man committed great sin. A great sin, sacrilege. It was an insult against the great God of heaven and earth. He acted in a spirit of contempt and defiance against God. And God acted quickly, swiftly, bringing sudden condemnation and destruction upon him, upon his princes, upon his wives, upon his concubines, and upon the kingdom. And let's see all this is. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 22. Isaiah chapter 22, we're reading from verse 12. Isaiah 22, we're reading from verse 12. Here is what it says. And in that day, did the Lord God of us call to weeping, and to mourning, and to boldness, and to getting with sack clothes. You see, this uh, man who was not going to real judgment in verse 13, it says, Behold, joy and gladness, slaying oxen and killing sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine. That's the feast itself. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. That's what we were thinking. Let's enjoy ourselves. Let's drink what we need to drink. Let's eat all we need to eat. After all, man does not continue here forever. For tomorrow we shall die. The Lord did not even give him the privilege of living till tomorrow. For tonight, Belshazzar, you will die. You see, when somebody goes beyond the day of grace, 
and he goes beyond the period of mercy and then does it and does it and then he has what is called the superfluity of naughtiness. That's what James calls it. James said, this is the superfluity, the surplus, something that goes beyond overflowing evil. That he was drinking and then he went to take the vessels of the house of the Lord and to drink from that. And with that superfluity of naughtiness and pride, swift judgment will come. In verse 14, and it was revealed in mine ears by the Lord of hosts. Surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till ye die, says the Lord God of hosts. I pray it will not happen to you. Nahum chapter 1. Nahum chapter 1. We're looking at when people go ahead and they do something like this. They disregard God. They dishonor God. They insult God. They belittle God. They disdain God. And what happens to them? We're looking at Nahum chapter 1 verses 10 and 11. In verse 10, for while they be folding together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as trouble fully dry. It says, while the wine is with them, and while they are drunken in disrespect and disregard to the Almighty God, it says they will be destroyed. In verse 11, there is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. You see, that's what Belshazzar did. He imagined evil against the Almighty God. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 5. Habakkuk chapter 2, reading from verse 5. Ye also, because he transgressed by wine, is a proud man, neither keepeth he at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. Shall not all these take up a parable against him, and a taunting proverb against him, and say, Woe unto him that increaseth that which is not his. How long unto him that ladeth himself with thick claim shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee, and awake that shall vex thee, and thou shalt be for the booties unto them in verse 8, because thou hast spoilt many nations. All the remnants of the people shall spoil thee because of men's blood and for the violence of the land and of the city and of the dwelling therein. Look at verse 15. In verse 15 it says, Woe unto him that does what? Tell me out loud. Giveth his neighbor drink. All those thousands of people, they were not thinking of drinking wine and getting drunk. All those thousands of people, they were not thinking of insulting the Almighty God and taking the vessels out of the house of, that they have taken out of Jerusalem and drinking out of it. It was Belshazzar that led them into that. He said, I want to dishonor the God of Israel. I want to dishonor the living God, the most high God. I want to dishonor the one that made his father Nebuchadnezzar mad and drove him into the forest. I want to dishonor him. And he invited all these people and gave them the wine to drink one to him. That, may, that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth thy bottle to him, that and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Thou art filled with shame for glory. Drink thou also, and let thy first king be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. That's talking about the judgment that will come. But uh, let's come back to this Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. And here we're looking at something. We're looking at verse 2. And looking at verse 3. Daniel. Chapter 5. Verses 2 and 3. And let us see something here. Let's observe. 
what this man did and what is it the Lord is teaching us that we're learning from this. Daniel chapter 5, I'm looking at verse 2. And Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and the silver vessels. What did he say they should bring? Okay, remove the golden and the silver. What did he say they should bring? The vessels, the vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar are taking out of the temple which was in Jerusalem. And the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines that they might drink therein. And then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the law of the house of God which was at Jerusalem. And the king and the princes and his wives and his concubines drank in them. In short, what are we going to say he did? He desecrated. Desecrated. You know, to consecrate is to give something to the Lord. And it's to make that thing pure. To keep it clean. And then separate and devote that thing, consecrate it unto the Lord. But to desecrate, that's the opposite. That means you defile it, you desecrate it, you make it dirty, and then you do something with it that is insulting to the Almighty God. I told you, I read it to you already. All these things are written for our learning. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. And what things soever were written aforetime, they were written for our admonition that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. What do I have to do? What do you have to do? Well, the vessel. And what is the vessel pointing to? And how can somebody do that today and take the vessels, understand something consecrated to God? Something devoted to God, something abandoned to God, something that is holy, separate for the service of the Lord, a vessel, and then desecrate that today. And then let's look at what the scripture actually is pointing to, ultimately when he's talking about vessel. I'm looking at, I'm looking at 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8, we're looking at verse 4. First Kings chapter 8, we're looking at verse 4. Here it says in verse 4, And they brought up the ark of the Lord, and the tabernacle of the congregation, and all the, what's the rest? Holy vessels that were in the tabernacle. Even those did the priests and the Levites bring up. Understand there's something you mark in your mind. Something you underline in your Bible. Something you focus on as you think about the vessels. It is holy vessel. It's only to be for holy use. Holy use. Sacred use. Sanctified use. Now we look at 1 Samuel chapter 21. 1 Samuel chapter 21. I'm reading now from verse 3. 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 3. Now therefore, what is under thine hand? Give me five loaves of bread in, thy, in mine hand, and of what there is present. And the priest answered David and said, there is no common bread under my hand, but there is hallowed bread, sacred bread, separated bread. And then it says, if the young men have kept themselves at least from women, if they have kept themselves holy and righteous and pure, separated, consecrated, then I can give them the special sacred bread. Verse 5 and, they, and David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth, we men have not have been cared from us about these three days since I came out. And the vessels of the young men are what? Holy. What does it mean, the vessels of young men? The body of the young men. That's the vessel. That's the vessel. Now, a child of God is not the vessel. It's a holy vessel. And when you take that body of yours, and then you defile, you desecrate that body. That's like what Meshazah did. 
you are not going to take something now and take an instrument in the house of God. We've gone beyond that. This is New Testament dispensation. Now, the, the vessel is your body. And when that is defiled or sin, and when that is desecrated with evil, that's exactly what Belshazzar did. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 22. Jeremiah chapter 22. I'm reading from verse 28. Jeremiah chapter 22 verse 28. The vessel, holy vessel. What did, uh, what was uh, Belshazzar thinking? Belshazzar was thinking that these uh, vessels, they don't have any honor anymore. And there's no pleasure in them anymore. They have something that, that they don't have any glory anymore. After all, my father has taken them away from Jerusalem. And they have been in Babylon all through these years. There's not anything pleasant about them anymore. Let me drink wine with them. We're looking at Jeremiah 22 verse 28. Is this man Coniah, a despised, broken idol? You see, a vessel wherein is no pleasure. A vessel wherein is no pleasure. When somebody looks at a child of God and he says, This one is a vessel where of no pleasure. After all, he is not even a worker in the church. After all, he is not even doing anything significant in the church, but he's a child of God, a child of God. And then you think that that is a vessel of no pleasure. And then you do what Belshazzar did just with him or with her. And you say, I'll do whatever I want to do because she's a vessel. He is a vessel of no pleasure. That's terrible. And the judgment comes. We're looking at Osea, Osea chapter 8 verse 8. Osea chapter 8 verse 8. Israel is swallowed up. Now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no pleasure. The children of Israel as a whole, that's a congregation now. That's a group of people all united together because they were carried away captive. Then the Babylonians, they said, if they were having any pleasure, if they were pleasant to the Lord, how will they be carried captive? You see, when you look at a local church, a group of the children of God, maybe don't, they don't have a good building like this. Or maybe there is you know, a particular product, but that's the congregation of the Lord. And then you insult them, or you defile them. Or you do anything to scatter them, to destroy them. And then you say, after all, it's like Israel, a vessel that has no pleasure. That's why the judgment comes upon many people. They don't understand why. I'm looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, verse 15. Acts, chapter 9, verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. See that. Go thy way. He is a chosen vessel unto me. That's talking about Saul of Tarsus. And this is Paul. He met the Lord on the way to Damascus. And now the glory of the Lord is upon him. The Spirit of God is within him now. And then he's to carry the message of life. The message of the gospel of salvation. is to carry that to all the nations. And God said, he is a chosen vessel. If you see a person like that, and you said, I know his past life. I know what he used to do. I know what he did to the believers, imprisoning them and taking them into prison and captivity. And if I touch this one, if I destroy this one, if I persecute this one, if I defile this one, nothing will happen. Because I know what he did in the past. Now he is a chosen vessel. But Shasta did not understand. You know what? Nebuchadnezzar ruled for 40 years, 40 long years. And it was at the beginning of the captivity at the beginning of the rule of nebuchadnezzar he took all those vessels and those vessels have now been laid aside for 40 years and now belshazzar started to reign and he said all these vessels they've been there lying fallow for all these 40 years they don't have any value they don't have any pleasure. God, does, God is not interested in all these, uh, all these vessels because for 40 years they have been staying there. Bring them out. I want to drink wine with them. That's what you think because that Paul the Apostle, chosen vessel of the Lord. What's going to happen to this? And we can do anything. And if you do that, insult him, defile him, 
persecute him. Then the hand of the Lord touches you in a very terrible way. I pray we'll learn our lesson. I said we'll learn our lesson. In First Thessalonians, I'm reading to you from chapter 4. We're looking at the vessel. that We don't just take a vessel today, the vessel of the Lord. A child of God. And then just do whatever we want. Insult them, abuse them, degrade them, defile them, persecute them. In First Thessalonians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 3 and verse 4. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should obtain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess what? His vessel is sanctification and honor. That's why you cannot defile your body. That's why you cannot just mess up anyhow. That's why you cannot go into fornication, adultery, fornication, and then say, well, uh, God will forgive me. Yes, God can forgive you, but you'll suffer. Because the soul that sinneth, you'll you, you find the rod of God coming upon you because you have taken that vessel that shall be sanctified, honorable, holy. You've taken it, you've gone to defile it. We're looking at Second Timothy chapter 2, the vessel. Second Timothy chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 21. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself, from these, it shall be, it shall be what? Tell me out loud. A vessel unto honor. And when you read in the Old Testament that Belshazzar took the holy vessels, oh, and you say, well, why are we studying that? What do I need to do with that? Vessels, vessels, and then drank out of it. What does that mean today? Does that mean somebody taking the cup of the holy communion and then drinking maybe water or drinking whatever wine with it? It's more than that. It's more than that. Now, we are the vessel of the Lord. And if a man purge himself, cleanses himself, purifies himself from all these defiling things, he shall be a vessel unto honor. What's the next word? Sanctified. Sanctified. That means, uh, you know, you, you go to the Lord after salvation and the Adamic nature is dealt with. There is the approaching of that Adamic nature and then it does circumcision of heart and it gives you a new heart, sanctified and then meat ready feet for the master's use. When it says for the master's use as a sanctified vessel like that, you are just for the glory of the Father, for the honor of the Father and you are not to be used in defilement by anything in the world. If anybody comes to you and then says, I want to do that, you say, no, I'm now a sanctified vessel, honorable, with ple pleasure. And then it says, you are fit for every good work and profitable and prepared unto every good work. I pray that will be your Lord in Jesus' name. We're coming back to Daniel now. Daniel chapter 5, the supernatural finger and power of God. That's point number two. Supernatural power, a finger and power of God. We're looking at Daniel chapter 5 verse 5. In the same hour came forth the fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees moved one against the other. And you will see over here what happened. While he did that, judgment came immediately. The finger of the Lord began to write suddenly. At the height of his drunkenness, the king saw the fingers of a mysterious hand writing on the wall in front of him. The appearance of the fingers without the whole body of the writer frightening him, alarmed him. There were no claps of thunder. 
There were no flashes of lightning. There was, there was no sword drawn in the hand of the angel, of an angel. And there was no fire to consume and defile. But he was frightened all the same. And he became so feeble and faint-hearted. His own hands and his own fingers had desecrated the vessels of God's house. And suddenly the fingers of God appeared to write his doom and his damnation. He was immediately seized with panic and uncontrollable fear. And he had no strength in him. He did not hear the voice of the great judge. Yet he was troubled and terrified. He did not understand what was written. Yet the joints of his loins were loose and his knees moved one against another. What shall it be on the judgment day when we shall see? Not only the fingers writing on the wall, but we'll see will hear, will feel, will know the power of an awesome God. The terrors of God are unbearable. Repent, therefore. That's the message. The Lord says, we to repent. We to call upon the name of the Lord. We shouldn't wait until it becomes too late. When we talk about the finger of the Lord, what does that mean? It's, uh, that's identifying the power of God. Uh, they knew that in Egypt. Look at Exodus chapter 8, verse 19. Exodus chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 19. It's telling us there, Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. When that judgment came upon, came upon them, the magician said, This is no other but the manifestation of the finger of the Lord. The same fingers that wrote the Ten Commandments, will write the doom, the damnation, the condemnation of those who sin against those commandments. It's the finger of God that wrote the Ten Commandments. And those who sin against those commandments of the Lord, that same finger that wrote the Ten Commandments were right, their condemnation and damnation. We're looking at Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31, we're looking at verse 18. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an edge of communion with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, reaching with the finger of God. Eventually, judgment came upon Belshazzar. Why are we studying that? So that we will escape the judgment of God. You will escape. I said you will escape. A man will be a foolish man. If he sees what has happened to another person, you know, somebody is going in front of you and then he falls into a pit. That man will be foolish to still keep on going. You find Belshazzar going in front and see what he did. And then damnation and doom, condemnation, destruction came upon him. Everlasting punishment came upon him. Well, be foolish to then just follow Belshazzar and do exactly what he did. No, we're not going to follow what he did. We're going to escape the judgment of God in Jesus' name. Isaiah chapter 13 verse 6. Isaiah chapter 13. We're reading from verse 6. How will ye for the day of the Lord is at hand? It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid, and pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. That's exactly what happened to this Belshazzar. And they shall be in pain as a, as a woman that travelleth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces as the Flames, it tells us in verse 17. That same Isaiah 13, verse 17. Behold, I will stir up the medes against them. We shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, 
The beauty of the Chaldeans' excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's what Isaiah had said. And it came eventually upon them. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 7. Ezekiel chapter 7. If Belshazzar had just read these verses that had been reaching before, he was even born. And he would have been able to escape the judgment of God. But he was uh, too busy with his wine and wives and women and concubine and everything that he didn't have any time to read all these warnings, the prophecies that warned him. That judgment was coming. You didn't have time for that. How many people today are like that in the world? They don't have any time to read all these prophetical warnings that the Lord is giving us. And he's saying, this is what will be the lot of the unbeliever at the end of time. And because they don't have time to read, they're not afraid of anything. They just live their lives in sensuality and fleshly carnality and worldliness. I pray that those of us who are taking time to read and to study these things, we shall escape in Jesus name we're looking at Ezekiel chapter 7 verse 17 Ezekiel 7 verse 17 all hands shall be feeble and all knees shall be as weak as water they shall also gird themselves with sackcloth and horror shall cover them and shame shall be upon all faces and boldness upon all their heads they shall cast their silver in the streets and their gold shall be removed their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. That's exactly what happened to Belshazzar. His wealth, his gold, his silver his money, his popularity, his position they were not able to deliver in the day of the wrath of the Lord came and then was swept away into everlasting judgment and punishment. They shall not satisfy their souls neither shall they feel their bowels because it is a stumbling block of their iniquity. Look at verse 25. Destruction cometh and they shall seek peace and there shall be none. Mischief shall come upon mischief and rumor shall be upon rumor. Then shall they seek a vision of the prophet, but the law shall perish from the priest and counsel from the ancients. The king shall mourn, and the prince shall be clothed with desolation, and the hands of the people of the land shall be troubled. I will do unto them after their own way, and according to their deserts will I judge them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. That's the judgment that came upon them, and I pray that we will escape in Jesus' name. I thought you'll say amen. In Ezekiel chapter 21, Ezekiel chapter 21, I'm going to read to you from verse 7. The judgment that came and the supernatural power of God that came to bring this judgment upon them. In Ezekiel chapter 21 verse 7, and it shall be when they shall say unto thee, Wherefore sighest thou? That thou shalt answer for the tidings, because it cometh, and every heart shall melt, and all hands shall be feeble, and every spirit shall faint, and all knees shall be as weak as water. Behold, it cometh, and shall be brought to pass, says the Lord. All these things were written aforetime. They were written before even Belshazzar had his feast. If he had known, if he had read, if he had studied. And he had for taking notes that these judgments will come, he would have been able to avoid that. Look at verse 23. And it shall be unto them as a false divination in their sight. To them that have, that have sworn oaths. But he will call to remembrance the iniquity at that they may be taken. That is, they'll call their iniquity, their sin, their evil. He'll call everything to remembrance. Verse 24, therefore, thus says the Lord God, because ye have made your iniquity to be remembered, in that your transgressions are discovered, so that in all your doings, your sins do appear. In all your doings, your sins do appear. Everything they did, they mixed their sin with it. 
their transgression was it the iniquity was it it says everything you're doing you'll see i'm seeing your sin because i because i say that ye are come to remembrance ye shall be taken with the hand it tells us in verse 20 in verse 25 and thou profane wicked prince whose day is come when iniquity shall have an end. Thus says the Lord God, remove the diadem and take up the crown. They shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is and I will give it him. Verse 31. And I will pour out my indignation upon thee I will blow against thee in the fire of my wrath and deliver thee into the hand of the brutish men and skillful to destroy thou shall be for foil of a to, to the fire but that thy blood shall be in the midst of the land thou shall be no more remembered for I the Lord have spoken it that's a prediction of the judgment that was to come upon them. Now we're talking about the handwriting on the wall. Do you know that we ourselves, all of us who are here, all those who are living on the earth, everyone that has ever been born, everything you have done has also been written. And there is the judgment that is written against the evil that we have done. But in the case of Belshazzar, he had no remedy. There's nothing he could do about it because it was too late for him. But thank you, thank God, for you and for me, it is not late. I said it is not late. The handwriting that is written against you and against me, because of what we did in the past, all have seen and come short of the glory of God. That writing, negative, that should bring judgment, the blood of Jesus today, tonight, can wash everything away. And God says, I will blot out your transgression. I will take away your sin so that it will not be remembered against you anymore. Glorious news, wonderful news that everything negative that has been written against you, against me, against us, tonight, everything can be washed away. And they'll be washed away in Jesus' name. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. We're looking at verse 14. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was, that was against us. Blotting out. Wiping out. Cleansing out. It is, this is your opportunity. This is our opportunity together. As the devil is bringing the condemnation in your heart. See what you have done. See what you have done. See what you have done. There are some people that are carrying the condemnation and the guilt. They are carrying that about as their shadow is following them. And they could have solved the problem. Just stop where you are. And in your room or in the church. Anywhere you are. Just say, oh Lord, I know Jesus died for me. And his name shall shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. From all your transgression, all your filthiness, all your idols will I cleanse you. That cleanse is available today. I said it's available today. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be cleansed shall be purified, shall be washed. Everything shall be taken away in Jesus' name. For the people that do like Belshazzar, and you see other people praying, and you see their daddy Nebuchadnezzar praying and saying, I extol God, I praise God, I now, I, I humble myself in the sight of God, and then the sins of Nebuchadnezzar, everything was washed away, and then like Belshazzar, they said, I don't care for that, I'm not going to pray for that, I'm going to be a man, a woman, a lady, a boy, a girl of myself, and then your sin remains, and then eventually you have nobody to blame when you die in that sin and then you are judged for that iniquity you have done but the opportunity is there today that we can call upon the name of the lord and it says he blots out he cleanses off he takes away the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us and he took it out of the way he'll take your sin out of the way 
nailing it to his cross. And when that happens, God says, I'll not remember your sin against you anymore. They are forgiven and they are forgotten forever in Jesus' name. I need a good headquarter. Say amen. amen. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 17. When your sins are washed away. When your sins are taken away, when the blood of Jesus Christ is only begotten son, when he cleanses, washes, purges, blots everything away. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 17. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Not remembered again because of the mercy of the Lord. And that mercy is available for every one of us. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We come to point number three now. The soothsayer's failure. The soothsayer's failure and the perplexity of the guilty. We're coming to Daniel chapter 5 and we're reading from verse 7. Daniel chapter 5, reading from verse 7. And the king cried aloud to bring the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said, uh, to the wise men of Babylon, whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be, shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then came all the king's wise men. But they could not read the writing uh, to make known to the king uh, the interpretation thereof. And then the king, Belshazzar, was greatly troubled. And his countenance was changed in him. And his lords were astonished, astonished. Here we find the failure of these taggazers. The failure of the soothsayers. The failure of the people that were professing to have the power, the knowledge, the insight, the revelation of the Almighty. But they fell flat. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 44 verse 25. Isaiah chapter 44. And here we read in verse 25. Verse 25 says... That frustrated the tokens of liar of the liars and maketh diviners mad, that turneth the wise men backward and maketh their knowledge foolish. The knowledge that Belshazzar thought they had, the Lord made that foolish. They could not interpret. What an unfortunate thing here, like father, like son. Belshazzar foresaw the help of the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers, just like Nebuchadnezzar did repeatedly in his days of darkness, superstition, and ignorance. They, they always failed to understand or to interpret God's message from heaven. But these as bound kings always sought after them. They always sought help where there is no help. Seeking help where there is no help. How many people are still doing that today in our world? They have a little problem or they have a big problem, a major problem. And they're seeking help from man where there is no help. Jeremiah chapter 17. In Jeremiah chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 5. Jeremiah 17 verse 5. Actually, there's judgment on people like that. Those who seek after soothsayers. Those who are looking for hidden knowledge from the cult or from occultism. Those who are seeking from the supposition and the power of Satan. And they're seeking some things from those who say there's judgment on them. In Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 5, thus says the Lord, Cause it be the man that trusteth a man and maketh flesh his arm, whose Heart departed from the Lord. Have you noticed some people, uh, the promises of God are there? We can easily claim those promises, but no. Their minds are not in God's promises. Their hearts are not in the promises of God. And when they're looking for either guidance, or they're looking for direction, or they're looking for where to go, or what to do, they're not looking at God. And they're not seeking the face of the Lord. They're seeking after man. And it says, Cursed be the man. 
that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm, his support, his power, his sustainers. And then it says, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. You think about yourself. When you have a particular need in your life, what's the first person you think about? Do you think about God? About Christ? About the promises of God? Do you think about faith? And do you think about prayer? When you have a challenge in your life, what's the first thing you do? Do you do like Nebuchadnezzar or Belshazzar? As if you never had any promise of God in your life. Cause it be the man that trusteth in man and makes uh, the arm of the flesh his own strength and support whose heart they pass from the Lord in verse 6 for he shall be like the earth in the desert and shall not see when good cometh but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land and not inhabited will trust the Lord I said will trust the Lord because it says in verse 7 Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaves shall be green, and shall, be, shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither cease from yielding fruit. Psalm 146, Psalm 146. Remember what Belshazzar did when he had that challenge. He called for the soothsayers. He called for those magicians and Chaldeans and the worldly wise men of Babylon. Instead of calling upon God, his father knew God. Daniel was there. Daniel knew God. And they made Daniel the last resort when it was too late. We're looking at Psalm 146 verse 3. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the son of man, in whom there is what? No hell. And you see many people, they'll be going and coming, going and coming. They'll go, uncle, how about it? Come again. Uncle, how about it now? Come again. Cousin, how about it now? Come again. Because you see, they are princes. They have long leg. They have contacts. They can do this. They can do that. Instead of praying, instead of looking up to the Lord, it says, put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth. He turneth to his earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. Happy is he that has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. The Lord is telling us then, this is what you do. He's telling us, don't put your trust in all those people. Well, let me say a word about those who say us before I pass on. Because you see, there are many people, they still put their trust in who says. Who is the who say? Let me show you. J Joshua chapter 13, you'll, you'll find an example of a who say. And then if you are going to search people, they see vision. They tell prophecy, they interpret dreams, they go into trials, and they say, I was praying. I didn't even close my eyes, I saw trials. And then I saw something about your husband, I saw something about your wife. Who is this by the name of such and such? Is that your senior sister? Go and tell her I saw something about her. And then you are rushing and rushing and rushing there. You are falling after the soothsayer. And there's judgment on the soothsayer and judgment on the people that are following after the soothsayers. Those who are consulting. The soothsayers, Joshua chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 22. Joshua chapter 13, verse 22. Balaam also, the son of Baal, the soothsayer. You see that? You see that? Balaam, it was regarded as a soothsayer. Trance. Vision. Revelation, and you know his way was perverse before the Lord, was a backslider, still seeing vision, living in sin, rebellion, still seeing vision, and doing evil, still seeing vision, counseling Balak to give the daughters of Moab 
unto the children of Israel that they'll commit sin with them and still see vision. And Jesus said in Revelation chapter 2, the doctrine, the teaching, the advice, the counseling of Balaam, which I hate. He was into what God hated and he still kept on seeing vision. Those are the soothsayers. Balaam, also the son of Baal, the soothsayer, did the children of Israel slay of the sword among them that was slain by them. I will not follow after a soothsayer. I said, We will not follow after a soothsayer. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 6. Therefore, thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they, they be replenished from the east, and are soothsayers like the Philistines. They are soothsayers like the Philistines. You know what? Some people go to learn how the prophets of Baal, how the witches in the world, how the sorcerers in the world, how the people have been familiar spirits in the world, how they see their vision, how they are able to tell the future, how they are able to do this and do that. And maybe they even wash their face with water or whatever. And it says they are so serious like the Philistines. And God is against it. And God said, Thou hast forsaken thy people. And the word of God says, Thou hast forsaken thy people. The house of Jacob. Why? Because they became soothsayers like the Philistines. You know, those who are soothsayers, sometimes they tell you, they tell the kind of truth and say, But, you know, if they are soothsayers, if they are not following after the Lord, how is it they are still telling the truth? Have you ever noticed sometimes your wall clock is dead? And your wall clock died at quarter to five. The battery is run down. And it's not working again. And it happens to be that when you looked up, it was exactly quarter to five. And the dead clock is correct at that time. And then you sleep, you wake up early in the morning, you say, oh, should I wake up now? Is this six to come yet? Then you look up, it's quarter to five. The scene is just there because it's dead, and yet it's dead and correct. You know, those associates, they are correct once in a while. And that doesn't mean they are following after the Lord. I will not follow associates. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 16. Acts of the Apostles chapter 16. I'm looking at verse 16. And it came to pass as we went to prayer. A certain damsel possessed with what? A spirit of divination. This evil spirit. This is familiar spirit. This is not Holy Ghost. Acts 16, 16. It came to pass. As we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her master's much gain by soothsaying. The soothsayers are the people involved. The soothsayings. And the same followed Paul and us. And cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God. Is that correct or not? It's correct. Soothsayers can be correct once in a while. That doesn't mean you'll follow them. That doesn't mean you'll be seeking vision and direction and counseling from them. These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show us the way of salvation. And they she did many days, but Paul being what? Greed. You know, Paul the Apostle knew. He knew that this is so sane. Even though the information appears correct. All the same was grieved. And he turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. That's the reason why we are not going to follow them. In the case of Beshassa, he called these people. And he said, help me. Interpret this for me. Were they able to help? No. They were not able to help. And that's why we are not going to follow something that is not going to help. We are going to keep on following the Lord in Jesus' name. Job chapter 18. Job chapter 18. We're looking at a verse, we're looking at verse 11. Job 18, reading from verse 11. 
Terrors shall take him, shall make him afraid on every side. That's what happened to Belshazzar. Even though he called the soothsayers and the astrologers and the stargazers and the Chaldeans and the wise men all the same, they were not able to help. Terrors shall make him afraid on every side and shall drive him, right, shall drive him to his feet. And then it says, the strength shall be hunger beating and the destruction shall be ready at his side it shall devour the strength of his skin even the firstborn of death shall devour his strength his confidence shall be rooted out of his tabernacle and it shall bring upon it shall bring him to the king's terrors it shall dwell in his in his tabernacle because it is none of his brimstone shall be scattered upon his habitation his roots shall be dried up beneath and above shall his branch be cut off his remembrance shall perish from the earth and he shall have no name in the street he shall be driven from the light into darkness and chased out of the world that's exactly what happened to Belshazzar it will not happen to me I said it will not happen to you because he didn't follow the way of the Lord. We will follow the way of the Lord. The writing that was written against him, he didn't know how those sins can be wiped out. But today we know anything that is written against you, we still have the opportunity and the grace of God. We can call upon the name of the Lord, all your sins will be forgiven. All the iniquities will be taken away. And the guilt and the condemnation will be wiped away with the blood of Jesus Christ. Can we do that tonight? I say, can we do that tonight? Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord everything that is written against you, every judgment, every condemnation, because of the sins you have committed and because of the backsliding that has taken place, you want to tell the Lord, oh Lord, you are a God of mercy, you are a God of love, and you are a God that sent Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, to take away my sin. I believe the Lord tonight. I trust in the Lord tonight. I'm rejoicing in the fact that the blood of Jesus Christ is still mighty and powerful and the blood of Jesus Christ will take away, will wash away all my sin. If you will tell the Lord like that, he will forgive you. He will take away your sin. He will purge you, will cleanse you and the Lord will be so wonderful to you and then he says, I will remember your sin, your iniquity no more. No more forever. Even Satan will not be able to find that sin. Demons will not be able to find that sin. In the record of God, everything will be wiped away. Why don't you just tell the Lord, oh Lord, here am I. I'm sorry for what I've done. I feel the guilt. I feel the condemnation. Oh Lord, but I remember your promise. You have said, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Don't you remember when the prodigal son came back home and the prodigal son said, Father, I'm not worthy to be called your child. The father just forgave. The father just washed away all those iniquities and transgressions. And the father never mentioned it to kind of torment him anymore in his life. That's what the Lord will do to you also. That writing against you, that brings condemnation, that brings damnation, that brings guilt. The Lord will wipe everything away. Just say, Lord, here am I. I thank you for Jesus. He is my Savior. He is my Lord. I trust his name. I trust in the efficacy of the blood of the Lamb. To take away all my sins. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Call him Jesus is your Savior. Call him Jesus is the one that died for you. His blood washes whiter than snow. And the remembrance of anything you have done and the handwriting against you, everything will be totally, totally, completely forgotten. Thank Him for that. You believe it in your heart, you confess it with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord, that Jesus is your Savior. Confess it with your mouth, and it is so, and it is so. You are that whosoever. God loves you so much, He will not allow you to perish. He will not deal with you like He dealt with Belshazzar. You are different. 
Because your heart is calling upon the name of the Lord. And now remember, as you come to know the Lord is now your Savior, you are, you are a child of God, remember that you are now the holy vessel. You are now the holy vessel. And God is jealously watching over you. God is jealously, jealously looking at you. And if anything wants to come to defile you, God will defend you. He'll protect you in the day and in the night. He'll defend you and protect you against temptation. He'll defend you and protect you against the defilement of the world. Because you are precious in His sight. He covers you. He protects you. He preserves you. He's getting you ready for heaven. And will not allow anything to desecrate that consecrated vessel of yours. Stay in the presence of God. Stay under the mighty hand of God. He's able to keep you. He'll keep you from falling. And he'll make you useful in his kingdom. Make you useful in his kingdom. Will not allow any Belshazzar to take you, desecrate you, defile you. And make you useless and worthless in the kingdom of God. You'll be a vessel unto honor. Sanctified. Prepared unto every good work. And great will be your reward in heaven in glory. Trust him, trust him, trust him. And make up your mind. You will not seek help where there is no help. You will not go to the soothsayers, to those visionary people. And you are not going to mess up your life and mess up your testimony. With Balaam's, the soothsayers of the land. Stay with the Lord. The Lord will keep you. Give your hand to the Lord. He will hold you. He will not allow you to fall. He will keep you to the very edge. And when the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and we shall go to be with the Lord, you by the grace of God, you will be among the number, I will be among the number, we will be among the number.